Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. So as many of you, as many of you know that have been listening to me for a while, I love to talk about how women need to find their weight loss code, the importance of that, how there's no one size fits all weight loss diet journey, that you have to incorporate all of these factors or at least some of them to figure out what it's going to take for you to lose weight. And my guest today has an amazing story of finding her own weight loss code after suffering for many, many years with Hashimoto's and gaining over a hundred pounds and then figuring it out on her own and losing it. It is Stacy Robbins. Stacy Robbins is a soulful storyteller and key influencer in the global conversation on healing your life through Hashimoto's. Her award-winning book, You're Not Crazy and You're Not Alone, is filled with hilarious, it really is hilarious, honest and heart-aching moments along the journey of doctors telling her the symptoms were all in her head which I know many of you can relate to, to telling her a year and a half later to get her affairs in order. In her darkest moments, she dreamed her life and then has been able to rise to live the life of her dreams, raising her family in unique ways, traveling cross country, and then to Europe for months on end, leading gorgeous boutique retreats in Italy and writing her book, An Unconventional Life, where messes and magic collide, where she shares the wisdoms and tales of a life lived outside of the norm. She brings all of this experience and heart to her community as a speaker, coach, and dream advocate. You can find her at stacyrobbins.com. Welcome, Stacy. Hi, Karen. Oh my gosh, I think you're just a rock star of a human. I'm so <laughs> grateful. I'm so grateful. This is supposed for... to be about you, Stacey. <laughs> well, well, thank you. To, I have to start with my gratitude the same way I start my day. Like I just appreciate what you're doing and thank you for including me and your great message out there to serve and support so many women. Well, you are my woman. I mean, <laughs> I have thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of women following me that have a similar story to some extent that you yourself have gone through. Like reading your books, I was, I, I myself was like, oh, that's me. Oh, that's me. It was so relatable. And I, I actually posted it in my members group and just said, everyone, you got to read this. Like it'll make you laugh, but just also just make you feel like you're not alone in this journey because you were one of the women that you were, you really were doing everything right. Just like my own story, you were out there working out like crazy and yet you kept gaining the weight and not understanding what was going on. So let's start there. I want you just to kind of take us back to what was kind of the starting of what did something flip where it was like a stressful moment, what happened where suddenly your body started really to shut down. Yeah. You know, it's such a funny thing that, you know, it was symptomatic in my mid twenties, but I think a life of stress really was just kind of escalating to the point where it started showing up on the surface of my life through symptomology, because it's not like I had some groovy, perfect life and I was eating perfectly, drinking perfectly, working out perfectly. And then ta-da, you just have an issue. It wasn't really yeah, yeah. like that. The truth is that I was a hyper performer. I was on the stage all the time with my work of speaking and doing music. I was, you know, a workaholic for sure. I was somebody who was people pleasing and working from areas of um, old cultural things in my Italian upbringing and my religious upbringing. So I think there was just this storm brewing. Storm. Yep. Yeah. So, but things really, the atmosphere of my mid twenties was like I said, I was on stage all the time or in the recording studio and, or on a plane doing my work of, as a professional musician. I was married at the young age of 20. So by my mid twenties, I was in a lot of pretending, pretending things were better than they are, pretending we weren't falling apart when we were. And also, you know, a lot of that family of origin stuff was coming up. That was, everything was kind of messy, but I was just willful and pushing through, making a lot of money, doing a lot of goodness in the world. And, um, but I think a, a few things hit at the same point, like getting hit in a couple of car accidents, being separated from my dad, some being separated from my husband and then my dad beginning the process of dying at 49 years old. So I think that all of those things were kind of 
the catalyst to make these things come to the, the, the symptoms come to the surface in a, in a pronounced way. And I started experiencing all that fatigue and cr just that brain fog that I'd never experienced and didn't have a name for. Um, How old were you at this point? 26, 27. Okay. So very young, yeah. 26, 27. And I was, um, you know, having that aching deep into my bones. I was feeling pain all over. I was having anxiety. I'd never had a panic attack or an anxiety attack. And suddenly I felt like my heart was in my throat and it was going to beat out of my face. It was just, what is going on? My, my life, you know, I was trying to function normally, but it felt so unrecognizable. My hair was brittle. My eyebrows were going away. My skin was super dry where it used to be like peaches and cream. And even the color of my hair changed and the coloration of my skin. And um, it just felt like I was living in an alien's body, but I was still trying to be me. And uh, I'd go to the doctors and I'd say, hey, you know, I'm, I've got this, I'm gaining weight, I'm in pain, I've got all, I'm, my, my hands are cold, my butt is cold, I'm like all these weird things. And they were like, these are all unrelated, you know? And so what they do is they would treat me uh, with the, according to the symptoms, you know? And so here you can have this pill for that and that pill for the pain and this pill for the anxiety and this one for the sleep and this one for the cholesterol and yada, yada. And by the time they were telling me, you know, like it's nothing, but here, take this pill. Um, I was on nine different medications that could have had contraindications of causing a stroke. And oh I'm the gosh. one who found that out. My husband found that out actually. And so during this time, this was, you know, before www.anything, there was no Google anywhere. It was like me going to the health food store and seeing a little poster and, and pulling a, a tag off or something like that, or reading in a book and making a long distance phone call on a landline, like trying to sort out what's going on. And doing it while you don't feel well. I think that's probably one of the hardest things is to try to so. do what you're doing when the doctors don't believe you, your family members don't believe you, your spouse doesn't understand, and everybody just wants Stacy back to be the woman that she was, including Stacy. But um, I just kept going and going, but it kept getting worse and worse, and I didn't find a solution by myself um, for a long time. And then a year and a half later, I ended up so toxic. I gained over a hundred pounds. So I'd started this whole journey at like 135 pounds. I was now 270 pounds. In one year? In a year, in nine months. <gasps> nine months, a full year. It took a full year. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I, um, my skin was bleeding. Like if you touched my skin, just drops of blood would come out of it. And I remember going what? to one of the doctors who said, yeah, like my hands, if you touched my hand you, and, or if I went like this, it would just be drops of blood coming out. And I remember one doctor looking at me while I was sitting on his table and he said, Mrs. Robbins, I just want to let you know, this is what happens to someone right before they die. And it was really an, unbelievable moment. And I think that was a real wake up moment. I'm sure there were many wake up moments within the whole thing, but it was at that moment that I realized after 15 specialists and all these trips to my regular GP and all of the research, I just, I was going to need to figure this out on a much deeper level. So it was around that age of 27, 28, when I really had to look into my life and looking, instead of looking outside for all the answers. Yeah, because you, so you went to 15 different specialists. Just, so what kind of people did you go see during that time? I saw my regular general uh, physician. I saw neurologists. I saw um, in, internal, um, inter, internist. internist, sorry. Yeah, um, I saw um, pain and, specialists. I, saw, I went to physical therapy. I um, Endocrinologist. I, oh God, I went to yeah. a couple in fact, my endocrinologist was a diplomat and he said to me, let me just cut your thyroid out. Let me just cut it out. He goes, because we don't have to mess with this. And I thought, well, what are the co complications that I could have with that? And he said, we could, he said, um, well, we could nick your vocal cord nerve and paralyze you vocally for life. I was You're like, like um, I'm a singer for a living. <laughs> I said that. I said, do I have any other options? And he was like, God. And I was like, all right. I, and I just, I, I kept getting directed to, this is not the answer. And that's part of why I came up with that whole concept of the orange cones is, is all of those people outside of me who were not my answers were really redirecting me back to me as having the, the main answer for myself.
And then it, just, it just took you 15 cones before you finally were like, oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, and there, there were more than that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> those, were just, those were just the doctors. And the, yeah. that was even just the friendships. Like every, almost everything was an orange cone. It was like I was cordoned off from everybody. <laughs> and it just got, like looking back on it now, do you not think like, oh, it just got worse and worse and worse. And it was like the universe, God, whomever was trying to tell you gently at first and then it got worse and worse and it was louder and louder and more symptoms and more pain and until finally you had no choice but to go in. Yeah, I do think that. Well, I also think that as strong as our energy is to be willful, it's sometimes the strength of the message that we need to hear sometimes. Right. And I think that I was really willful and really like, I just want to get my weight down. I just want to get my body back. I just want to feel, you know, like normal again. I want to be able to pretend. And I think as strong as I was committed to, to that, those ideas was the strength of resistance I was getting and the strength of the, some of the pain I needed to personally feel in my own journey. Um, yeah. I'm not saying everybody has to feel that level of pain. I just think that I was pretty willful, pretty vain. I think I was pretty I think warm. most people actually have to. Mm, you think so? I think because women specifically were very... I mean, men too, but women were just so strong. We want to persevere and it's, and it's like, you know, you will go to the doctor and we want this kind of like, can you help with this symptom? And if they can't, we just, okay, we'll put it on the, we'll put our pain on the back burner and keep going. Mm-hmm. Is, we were so like that women. We're just go, 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 go and keep going. And until it gets so bad, I think that we have to listen because, and it's usually actually weight gain that makes a woman really start to go, okay, there's something going on here because they want, they can live almost with all the other stuff, but they can't live with the weight gain. Uh, I couldn't. That was really the point of me paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. was because I couldn't hide. I couldn't pretend anymore. You can't, you can't stuff 270 pounds <laughs> into a sausage casing and make it seem skinnier. You just can't. No, no. And you were doing, like I'm reading your books, you you talked about going to the trainer like every day and, and oh, yeah. eating all these, like going on every diet imaginable. Every diet. So were you compartmentalizing everything? Like your weight was one thing, trying to fix it. And the depression was another thing, trying to yeah, fix it. I think that's a good way to say it. I don't know that I really thought about that, but I did think that um, a lot of my other suffering would go away if I could just get skinny again. Yes. Or it was something I was willing to tolerate, like you said. I was willing to tolerate the other sufferings, the pain and the whatever. Um, but it was the vanity of the weight gain. And it was right in my face. And I'm a very vis- visual person, so it kind of makes sense to me too, because if you hide my work from me in my desk, if you hide it in my desk, I won't look for it. <laughs> I need all, I need my life out in front of me because that's, how, that's the, if you look at my wall, I have sticky notes. It's not very attractive. as No, the same. I've got them all over my computer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. But so it makes sense that if I'm somebody who needs things in front of me, it makes sense that what um, got my attention visually is what got my attention to take care of. So that's what I. And so when you say that you finally got to that point where it was time to look inward. What, what do you mean by that? I mean that, you know, when the doctors and it wasn't just one doctor, it tells you basically to go home and prepare to die. Um, you realize that any information that you find next is going to have to come from what you can't see because everything that was visible was pointing to something very tragic. And so I had to go into the, that invisible realm. And I went into that place of introspection of sitting on my couch. I went home. The first thing I did was I talked to my husband. And I said, and, and this was probably one of the hardest things and biggest surrenders for me is because uh, I didn't want to appear to lose. I didn't want to lose my marriage. I didn't want other women to feel like they won. I didn't want his family or my family to feel like they were right. And so I held on to my marriage a lot of times from that willful controlling place. Like, we will make this work. But at that point, I was just like, I want you to know you're a good man. I know we've gone through a hard time. I know we're coming to the light and the good side of our relationship, but I don't know if I'll be here. So I just want you to know you're free to marry someone else. You're free to enjoy your life. Like it was such an act of, um, I think, selflessness and humility during um, 
that I had reached where I wanted something better for him than I wanted safe for me. And, and um, that was really, I think, a beautiful moment. <clears throat> and, and then I sat on the couch because I couldn't do a lot. I couldn't move my body a lot. I was in pain and I was exhausted and my brain didn't work. And I would sit and go, what got me here? The doctors don't know the door in or the door out, but this thing came in some way. If I could find that door, I bet I could go out. And I felt in a way like Alice in Wonderland, mm. padding around, just trying to figure it out. And, and so, so did I started- you start mapping back? I did that. You know, I, I did some spiritual questioning with some people. I did a lot of it on my own, like God show me. You know, that's my vernacular, God or spirit. Show me what I need to see. Show me what I haven't been able to see. Show me what others can't see. Um, I'm willing to hear. And I got, I got directed to this point where I said, what is my body doing? Because my body's a messenger. What is my body doing? Well, my body is, you know, this is the way I understood it this many years ago. And I know other people have different th theories and I'm not trying to negate theirs or anything, but my point of revelation was my body is attacking my own thyroid. So where am I in conflict with me? That's what I, where do I not accept me? Where do I reject me? Where do I not love me? Was, was what I felt like my body was pointing me to pay attention to. And so I got to answer some of those questions. I got to look at how I didn't feel worthy, but I was a really good performer and a really good provider. And I felt like I had found a different formula to earn my keep and to make my worth worthy. And, and now I couldn't do any of those things. I couldn't make money. I couldn't be on a stage. I couldn't do all of those willful things. <clears throat> so I had to go into a really yin time and out of that yang effort time. And I had to find out where, why I was worth something without providing anything. <clears throat> and and who was I really? And and in my identity, not my role, because I'd played a role for such a long time that was reacting to ideas I had about myself and beliefs, which we <clears throat> all do, right? Yeah, and I just had to come into that identity place of who am I if I could never make X amount of dollars again, if I could never do something great in the world, like, and. And those were the questions that I had to ask and I just sit with them. And the answers didn't come quickly. And I fought with myself. I fought with those ideas. I fought with spirit or however we'd say it. And eventually I just kept sitting and I kept asking and I kept trying different things and reading and exploring and praying and meditating. And, and that's part of, that was a big part of my process is. How Stacy, did you know to ask those questions? Because most people would say, what's wrong with my physiology? Like, why, is, why do I have an autoimmune condition? Oh, it's genetic, and this is why, and I just need to be on some thyroid medication, and I have to live with this forever. Most people wouldn't go to that place of, how am I not, you know, serving? How am I, how am I trapping emotions? Or how am I not feeling worthy enough in my life? Did you just, did that come naturally to you to ask those questions? I think, I think in some ways it's always been my vernacular. My conversation with spirit has been deep over many years from when I was a child and I went through <clears throat> unusual things. I had unusual knowings and dreams. I also went through really tragic abuses as a child and that I went through personally and privately that nobody else knew about. And so I think I, I was really trying to sort things out on some deep levels for many years. So I think that part of going in, going deeper was part of something both in me naturally and then I had cultivated and trained up to, to do, to, to have deep queries. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's what I think. And then I also was a big reader. I loved psychology. I loved humanism. I loved comparative religions. I, I love the mysticism of the religion I was raised in and then um, the other spirituality I found after that. And, and even though I left both of those things eventually, there were just such great goodnesses within those that supported the mystic in me who really needed to live life on another level because the physical level was really a lot of pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. So I needed to find purpose. And so I just think that's what I did is I found maybe purpose in it and um, <clears throat> an important process in it. And I found that sharing with others really helped me. So yeah, I think that's where it came from. Yeah, a lot of I history. think so. 
I would say that too, like just reading your books, I would say that it naturally comes to you, but you have this incredible way of self introspection, like you, the way you can look at yourself from the outside and say, okay, what's really happening here on an emotional level, on a spiritual level, deeper level, and almost like separating the identity from who you really are and going, okay, what's really happening here? Uh, Stacey, you know, like you're, it's like you can question it. I can do it too, but I, I think for sure it was a learned process. It might come naturally to people like us where maybe we were just born with more of an intuitive sense, but a lot of it is learned that where we can look at ourselves objectively and say, what's happening here? What, are, what is this limiting belief that's, changed, that's you know, harming my life? Or why am I getting this disease emotionally? What's happened to me? But a lot of people can't. And so I really want us to share with the listeners how and, and the importance of doing exactly what you finally had to do, which was emotionally, why have I got Hashimoto's? Mm. And how it's so important to ask those questions, no matter what, it doesn't matter if you have Hashimoto's or any sort of health problem, suffering, even if it's just a lot of weight, getting to the emotional root cause and the importance of that. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> so the question is like, how did, how do you get to that point? Is that what you want me to address? Like, how do you get to that point or why is it important? Why is it important? Why do you so believe there's this connection? Yeah. How is it that that healed you? So <clears throat> we are emotional in nature. You know, we are, we have a set of emotions that we're born with and they're there to serve and support us. But so many of us have gone through as women, something tragic, a loss, a sense of abandonment, abuse, a, an injury, something <clears throat> that helped to formulate our ideas about ourselves. And I think that what happens is it becomes so uncomfortable to live in the feelings and the feelings live in the body. And that's where the abuse very often took place. And so what becomes easier for many of us is to divorce our bodies, to live in our head where things are critical and more mathematical or more we can justify them more and not have to experience them so much. And what happens is we reach a point in our life, which I believe is integral, and I've never heard anybody talk about this, but I, this is one of my personal theories that I'm writing about and I'm planning on bringing forth in the world, that I believe that when our, um, sorry, and there was the blank, there's the blank, <laughs> welcome to 51 and Hormones, this is really important thing. But there okay, we're all hormonal that listen to this oh, podcast, we all when understand. Our, <laughs> Thanks for the grace. When our prefrontal cortex finishes developing, which happens oftentimes around 26, 27 years old, I think we have a switch and that prefrontal cortex it, in our brain allows us to see consequentially what this plus this plus this could equal in our future. And it's part of why, you know, we have kids at 18 going off to war <clears throat> because their prefrontal cortex is not fully developed and they don't have a sense of their mortality yet. So I think that many people get diagnosed with autoimmune disease and I've researched this, many get auto, um, diagnosed around 26 or 27 because I think there's this thing in our development of our brain that allows us to see consequentially forward and therefore backwards. And we're able to connect again with how disconnected we got from ourselves. And it shows up in an autoimmune disease and we get the opportunity to go, oh, I've been disconnected. I divorced me a long time ago. This is the wake up call to reintegrate. This is the wake up call to reconnect. That means I'm gonna have to feel some feelings. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear here. Yeah, you, yeah go ahead. Shit, I don't want to do that. I don't want to feel those feelings. Those feelings are hard. It's hard to feel pain. It's hard to know what category to put it in. It's hard to not know how to heal it. So I don't want to feel it. <clears throat> and so I think for many of us, the wake up call of the autoimmune condition is to return us back to the body that feels the emotions so we can heal our whole selves to our whole selves and live as a whole person again. That's what I think the opportunity is that's hiding in an autoimmune condition appearing mm -hmm. yeah. to us. And the emotions are important. Why? Because they're an important part of who you are and you need to learn how to live with you. And mm -hmm. that's, that's something you've probably cut off and you've been able to live long enough, but your, your highest self is saying, no more. 
I want better for you. I want more for you. I want you to have the whole experience of joy again. That means you need to feel pain again. I want you to know how to live through things, not just to things. I want you to know that you are strong. And, and we get called to that. And so our emotions are part of that, Karen. Mm -hmm. I've had some amazing guests on my show, yourself included, but many who've talked about um, the trapped emotions and getting mm -hmm. sick from them. And, mm -hmm. and as a rolfer, I've known that forever because I used to do body work. If you don't know what rolfing is, it's very deep tissue body work for my listeners. Stacey knows what it is. Love, um, it. <laughs> love it. And we were taught in school that people that when you, when you don't deal with your emotions through life, what happens chemically, what's released from fear, from um, any sort of abuse or anything that happened to you as a child and you don't deal with it or any time in your life that you don't deal with it, those chemicals have to go somewhere and be stored because they weren't expressed. And so they store themselves in the body and it does tend to, you can look at different areas of the body and you can look at the chakras, the energy centers, which is science. This is not, you know, crazy stuff, crazy talk. There's actual energy centers in the body and they each deal with different emotions and thyroid. And there's so many women with thyroid and so many of my listeners have thyroid, whether it's just Hashimoto's. Mm so common in women and that's your voice chakra mm -hmm. it's not speaking up and stacy i would love if if you're comfortable with it can you just share what happened to you as a teenager because it just that i wept it was just so hard mm. and i could just imagine that that <clears throat> was probably a beginning point like you said in your book like you never dealt with that yeah <clears throat> so <clears throat> Uh, for me, again, whether it's the health journey or even the weight loss journey or that moment of abuse, <clears throat> I don't think it started right there. Mm -hmm. I think that there was a, a time that preceded that that really primed me to be in that situation. So <clears throat> the situation that happened, excuse me, <clears throat> the situation that happened was that my family had just moved to a, back to a town after losing our home essentially or having to sell it under duress and and we went and rented this little place and <clears throat> i was the new kid in school but i was different you know i'm developed and i'm growing and i'm and i got the attention of this man who was selling drugs in our town <clears throat> and he was giving them away for free and i put them in my hand and i just said I felt the weight of the world. I just felt this like awareness that I was not supposed to take these drugs. And I handed them back to him and apparently he marked me. There was something in him that really wanted to control me and he ended up stalking me. And um, whether I was at catechism classes and he'd be waiting in the bushes or um, he'd be waiting in the fields near my home and <clears throat> he was tormenting me and um, ended up on Halloween night when I was when I was 12, climbing in my window up the back of the house and raping me in the room next to where my parents were. And um, I never called out for help, never um, thought that anybody would come and do anything other than blame me. And it was confusing. So, and it was horrible. And he continued to do that for months and months and followed me and threatened my life. And he basically trafficked me to other people he had drug deals with so that I could pay off debts <clears throat> through my sexual actions. And it was just um, a big secret for my 13th birthday. He said he wanted to give me a baby for my 13th birthday. And it was just a horrible, horrible um, reality that I was living in alone. And so yeah. I... I just made this deal with God. I said, if I'm pregnant, I'll just end my life because I won't embarrass my family that way. And, and, um, and eventually I, I ended up trying to reach out to a family member who was older than me, um, who I thought could help. And I, as I reached out to him to say, this is what's happening and I need help, he turned off the lights and he started molesting me. And so the place there where I went to for help ended up making it worse. And just, I ended up with this belief that I'm not safe and I can't trust anyone. And that ended up 
that was the strongest belief that I got out of that was that I'm not safe and I can't trust anyone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, something not as nowhere near as what happened to you, but at a very young age, I had a friend, a guy friend climbed through my window and mm. made me have sex with him. Uh, I think I was 14 or something and continued on from there getting raped multiple times from different men and horrible sexual history. And I really do think when I learned that I had hypothyroidism, it was no shock to me. I was like, of course, it, of course, I never, ever spoke up, which I'm sure that you probably feel the same way. It's like, well, we didn't tell anybody. We didn't share it with anybody. It's like we trapped it all in our voice chakra and no wonder your body started to attack your thyroid with all of that stuff just sitting there festering that you should have said and you never did. Or just say no. <clears throat> just to say no. Or just, just to, to say it. help. No or help. Yeah. Do you, did you go through this, Karen? I felt like if I tried to cry, like it would, it was painful. I don't know if you ever- Burning in the like throat. Something yeah. was like pressing in and out and it was so painful that when I tried to cry, it felt like there was a lock on my throat. Yeah. Did you ever experience that? Yes, I did. Yeah. It was, it's always been there. And I remember getting um, work done as a part of rolfing sessions where they work on the inside of your mouth. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel good for some people. And I bawled like a baby and I had this, like, it was like a water fountain flowing out of my face. And then I'm, I'll never forget it because my rolfer wasn't the nicest guy. <laughs> he, was, he was very... Uh, intuitive but he was very just like to the point harsh and he's like these are all the things that you you wanted to say and you never did and I, <laughs> it just make me cry even harder mm -hmm. but for my own healing journey i knew that dealing with what had happened to me and not speaking up and not respecting my body and saying no when i wanted to say no and not holding these men accountable for what they did to me I knew that I had to go back and I had to look at that in mm. order for my body to, even back then, to let go. And I didn't know I had hypothyroidism then, but just to let go of the weight then, I knew that was such a huge piece of it where I had to heal the emotions. Yeah. yeah. I want to know how you did that. I, oddly enough, I... I had my breaking point, I think like most women do, like you did, where I kept damaging myself over and over and over again until it got to the point where I left, who is now my current husband, I left my husband, my boyfriend at the time, who is now my current husband, I left him and I was so in love with him, but he, he wasn't there. And I, I finally kind of stood up for myself and left this person that wasn't treating me right, which was something I had never done. And I was on the floor of the kitchen crying, hyperventilating, crying with my one-year-old daughter beside me. And knowing in that moment, I had to heal. I, this was, I, if I kept going the way I was going, these, things, the, these patterns were going to get worse and worse and worse. And this was, to me, the worst because I thought that was the man I was going to marry. Intuitively, even though he was just not committing to me, I was like, but I know that this is the man I'm going to marry. Like... I guess my intuition's wrong. I got to leave them. And so there I was broken thinking there's no hope for me anymore. But I knew in that moment, whether it was a God moment, I think it was where I just was like, something's got to change. I have to heal. I can't do this anymore or else my daughter's going to go. And my daughter, I knew in that moment, if I didn't change, she would do what I did to some extent. Like she would let men abuse her. She would let men do these horrible things to her that she'd be, she'd be a drinker. She would be a drug addict. All of these things. I knew in that, in that moment that if I didn't shift, she would walk that same path. Yeah. And I did get talk therapy for a while, but the biggest transition was I actually went to a woman who was a spiritual healer, a clairvoyant. She did energy work. And I saw her for seven years, but wow. it took about two years but to come out of that place and to lose the weight. And, and then my husband came back in through the door and we've been together since. 
Isn't that weird? So amazing. <laughs> How long have you guys been together? <clears throat> 10 years. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing. It was like two different people coming back together again. He had done his own journey and healed from his stuff, his garbage. I had done mine and we came back together. It was completely different. And I was like, oh, so my t- intuition was right. <laughs> it, was, it was the man I was going to marry. So yeah. You are so strong. You're so strong. Yeah. We are so strong. Yeah, way stronger than we give ourselves credit for. And I just feel like women just need to hear that you, there is that, there's always going to be that piece to their health journey, to their weight loss journey that has to be dealt with. And because you did, in your book, you're doing an amazing job of really speaking to all of the, also the medical side of things that you had to do. You had to get off Synthroid. <laughs> you know, you had to get on the right medication. You had to deal with stress, your adrenals. You had to take the right minerals and vitamins. And so you did this great job of like mixing the two, which is exactly what I do too. I always tell women like, you got to have this part, but you also have to have this part to it too. Mm-hmm. So tell us about your journey of, you've lost a hundred pounds or over a hundred pounds now. Yeah. Yes. yes. <clears throat> not a linear journey. No. Linear thing. One of my <laughs> feeling has been this straight line. It's like, oh, you start here and you just end up better. I didn't do that. I just, I am constantly negotiating along the way. And um, so for me and my weight loss journey, it's been quite a process. You know, some parts of it, I'll just say this, like I was just interviewed by the local paper and, and by Women's World magazine where they featured me on the cover for losing over a hundred pounds. And I, and they were like, so what's the one diet you did? I'm like, oh, yeah. oh sweetheart, <laughs> we're going to need a minute. You know, it's not like that no. because it wasn't just a diet. It was also revelation. It was also like consistently loving myself, even when the weight loss wasn't appearing. There were so many elements that contributed to the weight loss. So people want to know what's the diet or the pill or the magic thing you did or took. And I'm like, you know, you are the magic. And so you are learning how to be in that magical alchemy place with yourself. And so for me, it was like, some parts of it were the doctor said, I want to cut out your thyroid. And, um, and I said, I'm choking. I, I can't, I can't even swallow food. And he's like, we're going to just take your thyroid out. I'm like, what are the complications? He's like, well, we could nick your vocal cord nerve. And I'm like, but I'm a singer and a speaker. Well, that's the deal. And I was like, there's gotta be another way. And so what I did was I just stopped eating solid foods and I just blended everything. I lived on soups, not even realizing that I was basically eating an anti-inflammatory diet, not even realizing that. And I did that for four months and I lost like 70 pounds and I walked five minutes a day because that's all I could do. I was like so sick. I could walk five minutes a day. And eventually, you know, a couple of weeks later, I could walk maybe 10. And then, you know, months later, I could walk, you know, a few more minutes. And I did that until my thyroid went back down to a normal size and I could swallow food again. Now, obviously, when I started eating food again, I started, you know, gaining some weight because I hadn't learned the lesson of the connection of food. I thought it was just eat blended food. And, you know, and, and the thing is that I, because I'm a pioneer of this information, that means there were no other books out about this stuff 25 years mm. ago. It means that I was curating all of this information from phone calls and from my own library time and going to the orders bookstore and sitting on the floor and reading the books when they weren't, they would like poke at you like, Hey, you got to leave or buy the book. It wasn't like it is now where you here, have a chair and a book and you know, you can bend all the pages and then grab your coffee and just read in the bookstore. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like that. It was like, um, you buying that book, it's time to leave. Or I'd sit in a library or I'd talk to someone long distance. So, um, the whole thing on weight loss. So then I got pregnant. I was told if I did live, I'd never have children. I ended up getting pregnant naturally gained 60 something pounds with that pregnancy. And it was like, it's weird. It's a trip out on your brain to go, wait, I just lost all this weight. Oh my God, I have this weight on for a child. And, and to still not know that food matters because every doctor I went to said, it doesn't matter what you eat. Yeah. Just yeah. take these thyroid pills and you'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. That didn't make me fine. <laughs> yeah. No one said, Hey, you should probably watch out. There was no testing at that time about inflammation. Um, not even now though. Like how yes. many women that are listening, who have been to their doctor, not one of them have said, change your diet, do an anti-inflammatory right. diet. No one. 
the thing that's different is that there's alternate information out there on the shelves yes. or on the internet. There was not any, everything was supporting that. So I really had to go down the natural health route. So then I was like, okay, I started judging traditional medicine, which doesn't work by the way. I eventually found that there's a marriage. You just find what's yes. best for you. What's the wisdom, what's the wisdom combination that works for you as an individual? And you just don't judge it, you receive it, you bless it, you do it, and you just keep listening to your body emotions. Again, you got to connect to your body to be able to listen to it. And that's what I kept doing. So I'd go and I'd learned about a candida diet. Maybe I have yeast. Okay. Let me do this yeast connection book and let me find, Oh, there's a nutritionist who costs a million dollars an hour to go and take these supplements. And the testing was so expensive 20 years ago. It was like $2,500 to get a food sensitivity test. Wow. You know, like we spent thousands of dollars a month. We spent what we would have spent on a house. We spent on my health every month until there was nothing left. And except me, you know, and um, that's the prize, you know. And so the weight loss then was okay, well, that let me try Weston A. Price protocol because I heard that that will help if you have digestion issues because it's a lot of pre digested food. Well, I went from that to going, I really want raw foods. I was hearing raw foods and I'd lose a certain amount of weight with each protocol, and then I'd have a flare because of a, I, because I hadn't learned. I was learning, but I hadn't learned. It's so, so much different to be in a state of learning, but not to have acquired the full knowledge yet to apply consistently in your life. So I was learning that these things made a difference, but I, was, I hadn't learned yet that I have to live this way for a certain period of time and, and, and keep, keep living that way. So, and so I did Weston A. Price and I'd lose some weight and then I'd feel better enough and then I'd do more stressful things and do more work and make more money because I feel good. And then I'd reward myself with foods because I felt well enough to let me try that gluten again. <laughs> yeah, that still didn't work. My body still didn't make the enzymes, you know? So I was learning a lot of things that I hadn't fully learned. And so eventually I, I just kept, I tried keto. I tried South, I tried South Beach diet. I tried Atkins. I tried, um, AIP, paleo, um, I just, I, the hot dog diet, like I literally did everything. You <laughs> name it, I did the cabbage diet, the one that like gives you a massive piece of the toots, you know, and you're just yeah. like, oh my God. Yeah, I did all of it. And, you know, there are some key things that I have found in my life that help me now as somebody who oxidizes slowly, someone who's going through perimenopause, someone who's dealing with, even though I have low TPO, I mean, my antibodies are very low. They used to be in the thousands and now they're about a hundred or maybe less, you know, so my inflammation markers are pretty low. My sed rate is pretty low. Or I don't, yeah, it doesn't even register my sed rate, which is great. And, um, but one, some of the things that I've learned that really help me are intermittent fasting, um, grain free helps my body. And um, a high plant-based diet is really friendly for me, particularly, especially raw foods, because I, I tend to have an enzymatic issue where you know, my body is not producing enough of the enzymes I need. So every food contains an enzyme and they c contain the highest amount of the efficacy of them when they're raw. And for me, that works. So I eat my spinach salads, I have my you know, a little bit of protein, blah, blah, blah. And I just feel grooviest on that, even though I'm a chips and guac girl and I would love to have a margarita every day. And I would love to just like, if it's fatty and salty and fried, I would love to have it, but I don't, I can't live that way. No, no. And I love your conversation about just that acceptance that finally had to come around diet, that it wasn't, you were never going to be somebody that could sit down and eat the pasta. And that's, I, I find that was, the, I had to come to that too. And I want everyone listening that that's so key is to find your perfect diet, what your body thrives on and embrace it. Not like, well, we'll see how this works. And not to say it's, it couldn't, it could easily change. There's some things I can eat now that I couldn't eat 10 years ago right. and vice versa, but accept it in that moment of right now, this is what my body's thriving on. And you may never be able to go back to the gluten. <laughs> which is usually the, the worst out of all of them is the gluten. And that's, that's okay, right? You fought it hard for a while. <laughs> I did. I tried yeah. and I, I lost the battle with gluten. Gluten won and I lost. Same. But the thing, and I'm Italian, so it's, and I travel to Italy every year and I lead my Italian retreats. So it's really like, but the truth is it's been nine years. And, and there are so many opportunities that I have to have things that either taste just like that. But the truth is that, remember that saying, it used to say, nothing tastes as good as thin, thin looks or something like that. I don't remember. It was right. some goofy saying. 
but really for me, nothing's worth me losing my energy because yeah. I now learned that energy is my biggest commodity. If I can have energy and clarity of thought and have a dream in my mind, a dream in my heart and live that out with my body, that actually tastes better than anything. That's the sweetness of life. That's la dolce vita. That is, that is a la bella vita. That's a beautiful life to be able to go, I can travel to Italy and yeah, I can have some gluten-free pizza over there. And yes, I can have some gluten-free pasta over there and that's fine. And yes, I can have some gluten-free wine or Negroni. Um, and, and I can't live in that all the time. Um, yet I can have that experience, but it has to be within this constraint. Otherwise I lose my energy and then that costs me my dreams and my dreams are worth so much more than gluten-filled pasta. It's I'm, so I'm worth more. You are. And it's so much easier when you accept it, isn't it? Like you, you, cause you talk about like you're, you could sometimes have it, you know, like you could occasionally, and then you're like, no, I can't do it. I, really, <laughs> I tried hard. You tried really hard. And I say this because when I'm working with women, this is, I hear this over and over and over again that, you know, they do really well, well for a while and they've lost all this weight and they feel great. But then they're like, okay, well, let's start inviting all this stuff back in again. And the weight starts going back up and the addiction starts happening again to the carbs. And it's like, you have to realize just some of us don't do well. Some, some other women do, but the ones that I work with tend not to do well in those foods, <laughs> right? The or grains. you and I probably hear a lot from our clients this very common phrase, I've tried being gluten-free. I tried it for like a week and I didn't feel any different. Yes, like, yep, I hear that. Because it's not just... It's not just gluten-free. No. It's not just about that. It's about, there's the secret sauce of combination and gluten-free is just one component. Maybe you need to look at also dairy-free or maybe egg-free or maybe you need to really do some kind of strict whole foods diet for a while just to see when you take out all the process, processed stuff. Like I just did a detox for 45 days and a vegan detox. Like, is it my heart's desire to be vegan? Actually, no. Like I I like meat and I like saucy things and I like whatever. I can do it. If I, if I had to the rest of my life, I could do it and I felt good. I reached a point where um, I, you test pseudo grains again, like quinoa and millet and um, wild rice. You know, all those are seeds that vibe like grains. And my body was like, yeah, no, it still seems yeah. too <laughs> similar because we know about molecular mimicry now. We yeah. know that when your body has an issue with grain, for example, like gluten, um, like, like a wheat grain, that your body goes, oh, I identify that. That's a problem. Okay. Like when that happens, we're going to freak out. And then it just, it also finds things that are like that, that have a similar molecular signature as that grain. So that millet or that wild rice or something for some of us is yeah. also being attacked when, mm -hmm. or, you know, like the army comes out and yeah. it's fierce. So I just go, okay, that didn't work. I tried. No, I try. I still try. Yeah. Once in a blue moon. I was just like the other day, I'm like, why did I just eat that rice? I feel so sick. Like, I just stop it, Karen. You know, and I don't do it often, but just once in a while, I'm like, no. I'll start. Oh, well, maybe I'll just have a little, you know, it was my kid's birthday. We went for sushi. Oh, no, still can't do rice. I feel sick. <laughs> no. And it's so comforting to the mouth. It's got a viscosity. And not only that, it's a, it's a lowering, it's a cortisol lowering food. So literally it is a comfort food, rice and oatmeal, we know lower our cortisol levels when we take them into our body. And so when we're feeling stressed and then we crave it, it's because we are really looking for some relief and comfort from the distress. It's just, we are still picking something that doesn't ultimately work for us. We need to find a better something. Yeah. You know, it's comfort. And how about the stress levels? Because I know that for you, that was a huge part of it was dealing with stress levels. It still is. I have to just be honest. Like yeah. even this time that we're in right now where we're more at home. Yeah, the time is, of this recording where you're all quarantined yeah. for the COVID-19. So by the time this comes Thank out, you. I'm, I was I'm just hoping we're out of quarantine by the time this comes out. <laughs> <You're helping. laughs> um, but so we're, we're at home more. And what I'm finding is that, um, wait, what were we talking about being at home more? Um, stress. Just that you're being stress. honest. Yeah. It's the things so are still being stressful. Rest, being restless because we have more time to rest is something that this 
crazy Italian brain still deals with is like, because I am a productive woman. I am a let's dream dreams. I'm a generator. I'm a creator. I'm like, let's create a new business. Let's do this. And so when you have a time that's really about dialing down where your body's saying, I'm too tired. I'm too cranky. I've got too much brain fog. I shouldn't be pushing it. Or it's required to rest, like sitting on a flight for 12 hours to Italy. It's not like you can start a dancing career in the middle of the aisle. You know, like those points where I'm forced to rest and, and yet I still have this dream in my heart that I want to activate and beliefs that I could be, should be, want to be, need to be doing something that causes stress, that causes dis-ease, that causes tension for me. And I just, you know, I learned a lot, like you were talking about, whether it's from humanism, the personal development classes I did, the spiritual classes I did, all of the psychology that I've read and studied over the years and practiced as universal psychologist for years and years. Now, I know that, um, I know that uh, the way that we think about things and the way we see ourselves really is what causes the crux of the tension between us. So I'm able to observe a little bit better. I'm able to stand back, like you were talking about, and observe. Self-aware, yeah. Yeah, just go, oh, I'm the curious detective. I'm the curious observer right now. What am I doing? I'm restless. I'm being cranky. I want to eat, but I've got a commitment that I won't eat those things. So I'm feeling my feelings. I made a commitment. I won't drink those drinks. So I'm going to feel what I'm feeling. What am I feeling? I don't, and then I say to myself, I don't like feeling feelings. I want everything to just come under submission to my ideas. And I want no feelings and I want all productivity. Okay, yeah. well, that's not going to work because you're a human, not a robot living with humans, not robots. And I have to work on that. Yeah. So. I think, I think um, many of us do in this North American lifestyle, right? The go, go, go of it. It's so hard to get away from it. I talk about it all the time. I tell women all the time, you got to balance it out. You have to watch your stress levels. You got to do self-care. And for myself, it's, still, it's a constant struggle. Like you said, just to take your, like the productivity thing. I, I could be doing this. I could be go, go. I should be doing this and this and this and this. And then you're like, well, maybe I shouldn't anymore. And you may need to pull back a little bit. But yeah, you talk about um, in, in your book at the very end. I just love this. And I think this would be a great place to end our conversation. But these questions to ask yourself when things, well, you say valuable questions to help you down off the ledge of insanity. <laughs> Did I write that? Oh, good. You're going to remind me what those are. Yeah, I, I will. I will. So if you want to touch, you can touch on these. Um, ask, asking yourself these questions, and I think this is something that we can just be asking ourselves at any point in time in a health journey, which is, number one is, am I not expressing myself? So true. Like, right there, is that not the thyroid, right? You know, talking about thyroid, but I think just in general, women having any sort of dis-ease, are you not expressing yourself the way you should be? Because that could be causing you discomfort in your life. Absolutely. And I think that what happens is we have to go on the journey of being clear on what we want and what we need instead of expecting someone else to know us better than we know ourselves. And instead of expecting someone else to fulfill those needs and wants other than ourselves. Like, and that's why one of my power statements is I am the grown up. I have been looking, I am the grown up in the room. Like I look around the room. I remember I was looking around the room and thinking for years, I, who, which one of these women who is sitting here is smarter than I am? Who's who can lead me to myself. And, and it's like, I realized as I scanned the room, always looking for that better woman and my, ha my eyes rested on my lap and my hands. And it was like, I am the grown up in the room. Yeah. So it's up to me to know what I want, to say what I want and need, and to also be the first person to act on providing it for myself, rather than expecting my spouse to do it, or my kids to do it, or my parents to do it, or my job to do it. No one else is here to make me happy. And if they are, then I haven't cultivated a healthy bond or raising of my children or healthy partnership in my relationships. I'm responsible to say, I need this. I want this. This doesn't feel good. And then I have to be the first one to activate change rather yeah. than expecting everyone else everyone to make else. me the center of their world. Yeah. Take responsibility. Yeah. That's huge. I think that's the, one of the biggest things that we can all do is take responsibility for our own lives and where we're at. Quit yeah. blaming it on the people around us. 
I am, am I in a relationship that is out of balance? I really think that can be a relationship with anyone, can't it? Like it's not, we're not just talking about spouse. Yeah, it's not just spouse and every relationship that's out of balance is pointing us to see where we're out of balance in our relationship with ourselves. I believe that everyone in our life is a mirror in some way. You know, they're not just a teacher or opportunity. Like they're, they're a mirror. They're showing me where I am out of balance in me. And so where am I expecting that person to read my mind? Where am I expecting that person to do more for me? Where am I expecting that person to make me happy? Where am I expecting that person to police my foods or police my medicines or help take my health to the next level? And, and that's like, that can show up more in a spousal relationship, but you can look at your work relationships and see imbalances. You can see where maybe in your family of origin with your parents, where maybe they expect you to fill their cup emotionally and they're living vicariously through you or, um, you haven't individuated and, and haven't owned your own agency in your own life. So, yeah, I think that when you notice an imbalance in a relationship, someone's controlling you or judging you, or you're feeling like you disappoint them all the time, or you feel like you get to judge them and be right all the time, that imbalance is showing you that you've got this polarity inside of you of good, bad, right, or wrong. And you probably need to come out of that judgment of that you know, binary relationship of there's one right part of me and there's bad part of me. There's the good part of me. And then there's the thighs. There's the, <laughs> you know what I mean? There's just, and, and you probably need to embrace the whole of you. And once you do that, once you get holistically accepting and embracing, you end up finding partnerships and relationships that are more holistic of enjoying all of you and being able to enjoy all of them. So mm -hmm. that's what I notice. Mm -hmm. Okay, one more, which I just think is, I love this one for myself. I'm, I'm going to start saying this more to myself. Um, am I doing a protocol for my health that is out of alignment with my beliefs? <laughs> oh, you're so cute. Why does that mean something to you? Because how many freaking protocols I've done in my life trying to address a health problem, like jumping onto the next best something. And I think that that's, we, we're so like that as North Americans, just what's the next best diet? What's the next best protocol? What's the next? And so you're suddenly, you find yourself, I was just talking to a woman the other day. She'd, she's probably spent like $20,000 in the last six months on protocols and supplements and her infrared sauna. And she was just, she, she, she messaged me to ask about this whole other protocol. And I was like, whoa, down stop buying supplements like you're in this purchasing frenzy which i've been before myself where you're just looking for the next best thing because you're not wanting to actually look inside and figure out what's actually going on that's so important that you brought that up it's a first date syndrome it's like we love first dates but we don't really know how to be in a relationship yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so if you picked one protocol and you did even one element of a whole protocol consistently, like you'd probably have more success than if you just keep jumping from one to another to another, because really we get, we fall in love with the starting minds. We fall in love with starting and finishing, you know, like, Oh, I'm at the beginning of a race. Oh, I finished a race, you know, but where we really meet ourselves is in the middle. We meet ourselves in that long middle part of the marathon of life where we're just consistent. There's not necessarily immediate rewards. There's no fanfare. There's no like, I'm so inspired. It's just that steady consistency of doing the right thing, even if it's not the easy thing. And it's trusting that the consistency is doing a deeper work than, than you're trying to go wide and thin, you know, with all those jumping around from here. And that's what many of us need is to be able to go deep and long with ourselves so that we can meet and encounter us. But we don't feel, we don't ever really have that because we don't let ourselves experience the boredom, the frustration, the um, just strengthening those muscles of consistent actions over time. And so that happens a lot for people. And I was one of those people. That's why my Taoist practice, um, where I lead people and myself through 100 days, uh, a Taoist practice of 100-day gong, we do the same thing consistently for 100 days. And I've been doing it since 2014. Dr. Pedram Shojai introduced me to it. And I've been doing it with my community for years now. It's changed my life. Because to have to do something past all the fanfare and before all of the rewards that's where I've met me and I trust me. I respect me and, and I know me. So I live that 
confidence out and that trust, self-trust out better in the world. So when we jump from protocol to protocol, I think we're missing out on us. Absolutely. Well, and we're avoiding us. Yes. Yeah. We're avoiding we're, us. We're, and, but we're looking we're for the shiny on, on object going, I don't want to look at this shit in here. So let's, let, let's, what's the next new protocol? What's the next best diet to do? What's the next best supplement to take? When yeah. really it just, we got to go in and then you're going to know. And there's certain protocols too, like when you're saying like it's not in alignment with you, get, find something that is in alignment and then you stick with it instead yeah. of jumping to the next one. Yeah. Now looking back before we wrap this up, Stacey, you, this long journey that you've been on, you've, you've lost all of this weight, which is amazing. You've reclaimed your health. Your antibodies are down. Like you're doing amazing. You are. And you're sharing your work with everybody. Look, what is your kind of top advice? If you could go back to your younger self and say like, or, or to all the women that are listening that aren't there, that are in the depths of Hashimoto's or some other chronic health problem, what do you say to these women? Where can they, so that they can avoid the many years that you and I both had to suffer through trying to find these answers going from doctor to doctor. Do you have one or two things that you could say to these women? Yes. If I could tell the younger me, if I could just look younger Stacy in the eyes, I would say, you are not what happened to you but you can use what happened to you. And so to remember that your identity is different than an event. And in the same way, you're not, a, you're not the flu when you get the flu. You are not that, that hard, bad thing that happened to you. That'd probably be the first thing. The second thing is I would say, be okay with you. And, and it's kind of like driving. When you stay in your own lane, and you keep your eye on who you are, and you don't compare to the left or to the right, you're gonna have so much more fun with the amazing wonder that you are. And the third thing that I would say to Stacy is, you, honey, are 100% responsible for your life, your health, your happiness, and your peace. It is not on anyone else to do those things. It is on you. And when you know that, you won't just have the responsibility. You will have the joy of being with you. And that's what I would tell me. Yeah. I love it. And all these wonderful women. And you actually offer private coaching. So for somebody that is interested, she's got a number of books. I've only read two, which I loved. You're not crazy. You're not alone is the one about Hashimoto's. But honestly, Anyone with a health problem should read this one because there's just so many good little nuggets in there. Uh, you've got retreats to Italy, to Greece, all of these amazing things. So tell us what you, tell us how you can help these women that are listening. Yeah, I create experiences and encounters of you knowing you better and you loving you more. And so I do that through my coaching. Uh, where people work with me one-on-one. -on -one. I do that with my group experiences, whether it's the 100 Day Gong or the uh, Hashimoto's course that I've created or through my retreats where we go and we risk adventure because there's something about when you have to get past what your mind says is okay and you get on a plane and you stand in new soil in a place where people speak a different language and you're cared for and loved there, that opens your heart up to and your brain up to experiencing a new or renewed aspect of yourself. And so that is what I do. And they can, like I said, we can do private coaching. We can do group classes and um, with my courses uh, that I do. Or you can experience yourself through my books. You will see the stories mm -hmm. uh, in there and you'll read them and you'll see yourself in the stories. And that will heal you. So wherever you're at, there's a way for you to experience you even more. And you'll laugh and you cry too in her books, laughing quite a bit actually, because you're so I funny. <laughs> you're just so funny. There was like, I went to tell my family, you know, told my sister, oh my gosh, this one story when she was at a wedding and she ate this gluten and she was <laughs> had to run to the back. Like, I was like, oh my gosh, so many funny, funny stories. So I appreciate how open you are in your books and how vulnerable you are because there's, there are stories that I think we can all, like I said, we all re will relate to some, something in your books. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, yes, that's me. <laughs> it's messes, messes and magic. Yes. 
Yes. Uh, okay, Stacy. So stacyrobbins.com. You've got, a, you do have a free opt-in of some sort. I do. And we are just working on the website. We've been moving everything over to a new host. So we've been writing, okay. rewriting things. So you, if you go there now, probably by no, the time this yeah. broadcast is up, everything will be groovy and, and gorgeous again. So. Yeah, Cause you yeah, had like a 90 day or something, right? Like a free gift on your website? Yes, I, yeah. I always have a free something on there. Yes. I, okay. I have to go out there and tell you what it's, it is. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's no so problem. Cool. No matter what you guys, you can just go there. She's got something for you. Okay. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> okay. Stacy, thank you so much for coming on the show. I sure appreciate it. And I love to talk to you. Thank you, Karen, for having me.